you for joining this panel on diversity, equality, inclusion, integration, uh, which are actually not quite the same thing, but we do work with both in the system inspired environment. Uh, so we are very grateful to, to extremely busy people, but that's why they're busy is because they can always add more things and do them all equally well, uh, always taking in more ideas and to more exchange. Uh, Jennifer Stum and John Eduze. Uh, and um, we will be, um, in a dialogue uh, with them uh, with some examples of their work, but also of their uh, stories uh, of what they have observed and try to get some concept that we can take along to the next week of the Seyo Summerfest. Also think that we may have mentioned in the opening session uh, some keywords that uh, we would like to have as take home message while we try to grow and make progress with these key uh, concepts of, of diversity, mostly with which, which I think is what um, Kevin will mostly be talking about uh, and uh, which has informed um, an activity of Jennifer that she will uh, also present uh, next week in the panel of the Luca uh, connection with uh, with uh, Virtuoso Bel Canto on Music is Life session. Uh, and we'll also have another bridge to another uh, session from next week, the, um, Ac the uh, Academy of, um, of Impact in Music uh, that will involve Fiona Cunningham and some of her collaborators. Uh, so with, there is a, a wonderful continuity between uh, the two panels, the safety and diversity panel, but also a very inspiring one towards what we are going to be looking yeah. ahead for. So uh, thank you, Jennifer, who is right, right before, she, she doesn't rest every day like this, she said, for our, her, her diversity inspired uh, activities, but she made time before a concert, which is wonderful. And um, thank you. It, we'll be very happy to listen to you, not only as a musician, but also as a thinker and as, as a gentle but determined activist. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you and uh, to talk with fellow uh, activists who believe that actually the future of classical music um, can look very different actually than the way that it has in the past and should look very different. Uh, I'm a, a violist and a professor in Vienna. Uh, I uh, had a quite privileged musical background going to great conservatories uh, and playing concerts around the world. Uh, but my family background is actually quite different. Uh, my mother was uh, largely from a Cherokee background uh, and from a family who suffered a lot in the Depression era South, but who were also extraordinarily musically talented. And so at some point in my life, I started asking questions, which is actually, I think my mother and my grandmother had the same ears that I did, but they certainly didn't get the same chances uh, to develop their talent in the way that they provided those opportunities to me. And um, I'm going to share my screen with you here. Uh, so about um, seven years ago, I started doing quite a lot of work in Latin America as a soloist playing with orchestras. And uh, every time that I would go and do that, I would also give master classes and meet young people. And so I started doing some thinking about why it is we think some things are important and some things are nice. So I would say um, in the world of classical performance, we would say to play the concerto in a fancy dress is important. To give the master class for adorable children uh, from social projects is nice. I would hear people say that, oh, it's so nice that you did that. This kind of place is important. This kind of audience to play is nice. And that was a pattern that very much repeated. And I would hear my colleagues say words like that. And so um, I started really thinking, what if we instead believed that everything we did as artists, as musicians, as teachers is from a perspective that music is social work, principally without people, it doesn't exist. And from there, um, I had this idea to create a project called Illumina. Illumina started in Sao Paulo in 2015 with the idea that there were 
spectacular talents all around the world, many of whom, most of whom I would say probably start in social projects. I was not seeing any of those people on the stage with me when I played around the world. I saw very few of those people in conservatories where I taught. And that was certainly not because of a lack of ability to be in those places. So uh, the idea of Illumina was bringing people together who then would form a community and then any healthy community, they would blend, learn from each other. And our principal means of doing that at the beginning was at a music festival uh, where this is Lisa, who, who Kevin also knows, who came, came to our festival and working in small ensembles and playing uh, pieces together in a very in-depth way, which was the way that I actually learned um, at a very high level how to make music, how to learn to negotiate, how to learn um, to, to manage musical life by working with older, wonderful, qualified musicians. Um, we spend time together, we ask questions of each other, we eat together, we dance together, we socialize together. This is the basis of what we did at our festival. Um, and coming out of that, I would say that now what Illumina is doing around the world and we're doing projects in many places is that inclusion is a verb that actually having good intentions means almost nothing unless you're doing things that create inclusion, actual presence of people. I would say also inclusion is a belief that if you don't actually believe that someone belongs, they will never feel that they belong. And so often I saw activities where we were doing nice things for people, but I didn't see real belief that in any population of people, there are people who can absolutely be me, who should be me, who should become the leaders of their community, and we should invest in those people. So what we're trying to do at Illumina basically is to change the way that we think. So we think then that this audience of these are um, coffee agricultural workers uh and i should add that our festival takes place on an organic coffee farm which is a pretty great place to be in january um we believe that these coffee workers who are now all our friends and know our community part of our community are just as important and deserve the same quality as this audience uh in Salo sao paulo one of the great concert halls of the world we believe that someone who is a famous person playing Stradivarius is a teacher. But we also believe that that person needs to learn from someone who's playing a violin that costs 150 euros and has made their own way in life and somehow through their own grit and determination made it to a point where they're in the same room together, that everybody is a teacher and everybody is a student. To us, that is a definition of inclusion um, at Illumina, we say everybody rides the bus, and if you don't want to ride the bus, you probably don't belong in our community. So in this photo are people who are, you know, concert masters of major orchestras, people who are soloists with Berlin Philharmonic, and people who come from very humble backgrounds, and everybody rides the bus. And to me, that is uh, my dream for the future of what art and artists should represent. If you feel that your importance and status as an artist is such that you need to uh, make that clear by not riding the bus, you're kind of missing the point in my personal opinion. And so um, slowly over time, we have built a collective of people who share ideals, who share experiences and so that leads to our, our last key principle of Illumina, which is don't be a spotlight, be a prison. Uh, Illumina in Portuguese means uh, it illuminates, it shines a light. And our, our principal belief is that we want light that's a prism, not a spotlight shining on one person. And what is a prism? It's multidirectional. It shines light in unexpected places, like you're in your room and suddenly you see light, a small rainbow on some corner and you think, oh, how beautiful. In that one moment, you've added value to your life, your, the prism has. It connects the unconnected. It's complex, it's beautiful, it's organic. It's not something you can manufacture. And input and output are always related. So you will not have a prism without the right kind of light. And so from a pr perspective of music education, we at Illumina 
believe very strongly that the way that we input information um, is crucial to what happens on the other side. And that has absolutely nothing to do with whether someone wants to be a professional musician, actually how talented they are. We believe that music is this prismatic, powerful thing and that everyone deserves as a point of um, human dignity, access to quality information. And so aside from our performing activities, we're constantly working to enable and improve materials to share with our colleagues to encourage people to always allow music itself to have the power to impact people and that music is not a fixed thing like some kind of magical salt we sprinkle on top of social life but music is actually an incredible container for all the aspects of, of social life and human existence um we believe that if all of these principles are active and alive, if inclusion is a verb, if we are living inclusion every day, it's something you should see on the stage. If a young person is experiencing music as a holistic living thing, they will move, they will express themselves differently. So uh, we don't wanna see musicians who stare at a music stand expressionless when the conductor in front is being extremely expressive. What we want to see is a community of people expressing themselves in the way that is organic to them, inspired by whatever piece of music they're playing. And from my perspective, that's something that we should see from the basic level all the way to the international touring level. Uh, we envision a future classical music where we see true class and racial and personal diversity on stages. Um, not from perspective of saying, well, where can I find people who look different and invite them and put them? While that might be a very nice thing, it's actually not going to be the driver to long-term diversity and inclusion on stage. And um, going back to this belief in, in belonging, that if we believe anywhere we go and teach, there are people who deserve to belong, I think we will make different decisions. Um, and I, I think that that should happen at the social project level, that should happen at the highest performance um, level in international musical life. And I think we need to work together in a much more comprehensive way. And that's something I don't see happening very often, if, I, if I'm honest. Um, I think it's starting to happen more. Um, uh, here's a map of where Illumina Young Artists now are around the world. Um, and we, uh, we're very excited about that, that actually 98% um, of the Illumina Young Artists who have auditioned to study at leading institutions abroad were accepted to the place of their first choice. And I, I would say that's not because of amazing things that we did. That's because of the amazing work that they did. Uh, what we did is remove the rocks in the road um, that very often on a practical level keep people from accessing the quality that their own talent deserves. Um, so our community now is extremely broad. Uh, we're starting to tour, to perform uh, on concert series. We're starting to develop uh, more in-depth uh, educational residencies, uh, partnerships with other institutions. And uh, for us, I think uh, the world of music, especially international musicians, needs more collectives of people who believe together in ideals and who can discuss those ideals and act upon them so that we don't have this constellation of individual stars. Um, instead, we can feel that our combined power can actually create change. Uh, here's a little video clip, I think that represents very much uh, Illumina, which is uh, many individuals working together. Uh, always at the end of the festival, we play a piece all together. And um, this was uh, a few seasons back, but uh, still one of my very, my very favorite Illumina performances. <laughs>
So ideally, you should not be able to tell a difference between the concert master of the London Symphony and someone who's living in a favela uh, if they share equal autonomy and leadership in a group. And to me, what that video represents is what happens when you work and live and believe together uh, in your music making. And to me, that is the definition of inclusion. Marvelous. I mean, you could really see that they are sort of taking each other to higher and higher intensity when playing. You know, I'm, Wagner would be rather impressed, I think, with the, with how much path has has uh, really and how much water has run under the bridge. Really, extremely impressive. Thank you so much for choosing that one. I wanted to ask you. Uh, you have used the word inclusion, as you said, as a verb. Um, and before we, we ask Kevin to introduce his work, what do you see as a difference or um, as a complementary concept between inclusion and integration? Do you think that they are the same thing, that you think that sometimes it's one and sometimes the other? Do you find that inclusion is a, is a better word? Uh, I find sometimes that in, in, the fact in, in our environment, sometimes working with disabled um, children or adults, um, I see, I see that Taru is here with us and she will present on this subject. We, we find that inclusion is, is, um, is not quite, does not quite give the complete autonomy that integration does. And I wanted to ask you what you think about the, these two words. I mean, I suppose, um, I suppose to me, I guess integration would be the, the organic result of an inclusion mindset. Um, mm -hmm. I would hope that 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 would be um, for sure. I, I suppose on an academic level, you could discuss this for a long time. Um, <laughs> no. But uh, I also think, I mean, from my perspective, integration can feel very unorganic when approached without an inclusion mindset um, mm -hmm. as well. And also with a, without a, a deep sense of the autonomy of the individual at any uh, diversity of ability level, I would say that I think Illumina, obviously, in that video, these are extremely, extremely high level musicians. Yes. But from my perspective, the the same um, process works, you know, equally impressively with with all kind of populations of of musicians. Which which also brings up the the concept of authority and authoritativeness. And as we have a conductor here, I would very much to like to hear from Kevin. Now, we all would like to hear from Kevin how all these concepts are included and integrated. <laughs> thank you. I hope you can hear me. Well, first of all, thanks, uh, Jennifer, for, for this wonderful presentation. Very inspiring to, to hear you talk about this project. and. Um, Thank you, Maria and Sistema, for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, I think um, all these issues of, of inequality, uh, of equality, uh, diversity and inclusion are all related to awareness. We touched upon this uh, very briefly um, at the beginning when we met online, so um, I will I, I think we will uh, touch this subject later on uh, in the discussion also. But for me personally, um, it starts with awareness. Um, and uh, for me, it took qu quite some time actually to conceptualize what my role um, related to those topics could be. I come from a mixed race um, family. My, my mother is German. My father is um, a Ghanaian. Um, I was born and brought up in Germany uh, in a complete white surrounding. Uh, my eldest sister and me were the only black kids um, at school uh, with a thousand um, students. Um, so uh, for me, um, looking at myself um, and being surrounded by people who wouldn't always uh, make me feel different um i i yes i come from a very white surrounding um and it took me quite a while to to really um uh, find my my role in all of this uh, it started actually when i got a phone call 
um, from Chichin Wanako, who is the founder of the Chinike Foundation. Um, she called me and when I was in Bern studying uh, Richard Wagner score, um, I, I really remember this and suddenly I, I get this phone call and she asked me whether I could conduct her orchestra, the Chinike Orchestra, which is, a, is, is an orchestra, is a completely diverse orchestra, um, but the majority of orchestral members uh, is from uh, is is black is uh, uh, comes from from all uh, Asian uh, nationalities and ethnicities, and for me this when I when I first got to when I got to the first rehearsal of this orchestra, um, I couldn't talk. Actually, the, the orchestra was tuning and everyone was sitting down, and I entered the stage. And when I got to the podium, I couldn't talk for a minute because I was so shocked because this orchestra was so different from everything else I had experienced throughout all my childhood my um, and also my professional training um, to become a, a professional musician. And um, so this made me clear there's so much more to, um, to, to look after and to think about and, and um, and to define what my role could be. Before that uh, happened, I had thought of myself being an individual and I wanted to be perceived as an individual. I, I was confronted with a lot of racism throughout my um, personal journey, but um, nevertheless, I thought for myself, um, yes, I'm. but I'm here and I'm Kevin and I, um, I'm always the only one. Um, uh, I'm I'm the conductor, so I, I it's also fine to be uh, the only one. But when I met Chinike, I thought there's something more I need to explore, and there is a role of um, and a responsibility um, if we want to change our musical world because it's not good that classical music in particular is is not diverse. It's it's not a good thing. And um, uh, it's also something that needs to change. So what is my resp responsibility to change that and to actually inflict some change into what I do? Um, so um, one year later, I, uh, um, I conducted the Proms debut of the Chinik Orchestra. And I think I can, we can play a, a short clip. <laughs> Thank you. 
stop the video right here. All right. So this was just to give a, a very short introduction to the Chinica project. And just to make clear, this is not my orchestra, it's Chichi in Wanako's orchestra. And I'm sure Chichi could talk much more eloquently about um, about the project. But I think it was is good to just have a visual impression of um, what an orchestra looks like if it's not the standard white, um, uh, mostly male orchestra that we all are used to and that we that we all have to deal with in our professional lives. Um, you saw Janine um, uh, De Beek as solos and Sheiko Kenny Mason, uh, who's uh, who both have a, a great international career um, by now. Um, but when we talk about diversity, um, from there are so many facets and so many standpoints you, you could talk about. You could talk about institutions. You could talk about management. You could talk about the orchestra, um, about selection processes, audition processes. Um, I'm a conductor, so I'd rather want to focus on, on my role within all of this and um, how I try to, to tackle this. So apart from uh, once in a while conducting the Cheka Orchestra and supporting uh, their cause to, um, to support diversity, I also try in my role as a guest conductor and also as a chief conductor of the Munich Symphony Orchestra to um, look at very tiny things uh, that can change. So the question comes first, um, even if, if I'm a performer and I only play chamber music or I only do something on a very small scale, what if I'm aware that uh, the lack of diversity is a problem, what can I actually change? What, what is my power to, to inflict change? And for me as a conductor, um, the, um, for example, the tools of choosing repertoire, which is very important, which also, of course, is, a, is, is extremely important for someone who's just choosing a piece for himself or herself to, to learn. Um, so what do I want to perform is, is the question. What composers do I ask? Um, do I have the power to commission new pieces? Um, or do I have to repeat all the same repertoire that we all know and all, of course, love, but, um, but are, is there anything more? So it's also um, is a question of, of um, pure curiosity. Uh, what, what do I want to learn? What, how do I want to interact with, my, with the world uh, I live in um, as a musician? And um, so it's a broadening of scope that's, um, that's necessary. And, um, and we conductors have uh, at least sometimes the, the, the opportunity to, um, to present and propose new works to our audiences. Um, we have to negotiate a lot to do this. We have to negotiate with artists' agencies. Uh, we have to negotiate with um, the management of orchestras. Um, we have to um, find solace that support um, the same repertoire choices that we make. And of course, in the end, we have to deal with orchestras and we have to convince them that it's absolutely, absolutely necessary to have different composers on the menu and not only um, uh, Brahms and, and Beethoven. So um, starting from that very personal question, what can I do? I think you'll, or I at least discovered that there's a lot of things one can do to start that change. And um, I just mentioned a few things and I can only encourage everyone who's listening to think for themselves, what is my role in, in the music world and what can I do if I want to, to make, to inflict change um, in it? Um, there are a lot of um, things that we encounter that um, cause trouble and difficulties. We had um, the Black Lives Matter movement um, in 2020 that was a very defining um, uh, movement 
during the last year and um, I was very thankful um, that there was a great deal of repercussion within um, uh, cultural institutions to um, to really tackle the problem of, of the lack of diversity in classical music. But on the other hand, uh, what we also see and what what um, what I experience in, in talking to organizations um, is that no one really has a clue how to deal with this problem. Um, so um, I experienced a lot that I was asked for uh, guest conducting engagements by orchestras and then they very shyly uh, asked me the question, so, and would you mind uh, also performing a work by uh, a diverse composer? And my first response to that was, but what exactly is, is your goal? What, what do you want from this? And sometimes also um, it made me a little bit upset because um, people hadn't really thought about all the problems and, and, um, uh, and the complexity also of the questions uh, that, uh, that we deal with, um, but thought it was sort of the right thing to do at the, at the moment um, to include more diverse repertoire. Um, and in the beginning, so I, I always try to find the reasons and then I chose a different strategy and I didn't debate it uh, because I valued that people um, thought it was necessary to to bring different repertoire. And I didn't debate it at all and just made proposals with mm -hmm. different composers from, mm -hmm. from different cultural backgrounds and uh, without any explanation whatsoever. And this luckily resulted in the fact that um, next season, I will conduct a lot of diverse repertoire of composers that I really, really like and, and enjoy to conduct. And um, I, I, I will present those composers um, at orchestras like the Dallas Symphony Orchestra, the Baltimore Symphony, uh, Symphony Orchestra, the Juilliard Orchestra, uh, the Royal mm -hmm. College of Music. Um, the Essener Philharmonica, the Weimar Staatskapelle. So and a very diverse group too. <laughs> a, a, very, <laughs> a very diverse group in different countries uh, spanning, spanning the mm -hmm. globe. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, um, and so I think the change will just be there because we made this decision to change the repertoire. Yeah. And yeah. so next year it will be there and it will be there on the program. And I think this will be, this is not, not the end uh, of the development, but this is, this could be a starting point yeah. so that it's much yeah. more easy for an institution to say, um, oh, we hadn't thought about this composer. Yes, mm -hmm. let's do this. Yeah. And maybe to end, um, I want to give one very, um, a positive example where where this collaboration worked in a in a very um, good way. I find um, the um, Association of British Orchestras, the ABO, has uh, an, an annual conference, um, and next year this will be in Glasgow, with the uh, collaborative efforts of the uh, Royal Scottish National Orchestra and the BBC Scottish uh, Symphony Orchestra, and both institutions th said. Well, this is an issue we somehow want to address in the programming of that concert. And I talked to Alistair Mackey, the CEO of the RSNO, and, um, but we were just having a discussion just about composers, just uh, it wasn't, wasn't about diversity at all. And I, I said, well, there's one composer I really, really, uh, you should really listen to. His name is Sami Musa and um, a Canadian composer, um, and he did. And his response was, oh, this, this is fantastic. Um, and actually we wanted to include um, more diversity in also the ABO's program next year, and this would totally fit. But now we have a situation where the orchestra wanted diversity, but they also wanted a very fine composer, uh, which they discovered not by asking the question, is this a diverse composer? Yes or no, but just, is this a good composer? Is, is the quality there? 
and um, for for me personally, knowing that this is an excellent composer and a fine work, and this resulted actually in a co-commission of um, those two orchestras, thing in co-commission of the Vienna Philharmonic, who premiered or who will premiere this piece from um, Dr. Christian Tillmann in September this year. So um, all of this sort of uh, went in the way of of, of uh, supporting diversity, but also um, in combination with quality and a personal connection to what we want. And I think this is a perfect example how um, change could look like. Thank you so much, Kevin. I think this gives us a lot of, of thoughts to take forward. And um, I'm sure there are several questions, but I have two burning ones. Uh, the first one is um, whether there is a risk uh, when when we see the the orchestra and we saw a cellist who was white, you know. And I was thinking, uh, is there what we experienced when we set up our in Sistema program in Lombardy? We we were audited as a nonprofit organization, and they said, "Well, I mean, you're not only doing things for the underprivileged; you're also allowing." the non underprivileged to go, this is the, how does that fit with your philosophy of addressing yourselves to underprivileged? And we said, well, if we've got to do integration and inclusion, we've got to integrate into something, right? So mm -hmm. it has to be open, it, it has to be. So I, that was the first burning question is, is how do you see that? And the second one is um, about um, the, the various diversities. And we also have the, issue of, of women composers and women, women conductors. And, uh, and the, it, it rejoins my first question when we see that there was a, in Paris this competition that was exclusively reserved to women, La Maestra, last year, and there will be one next year. And um, I was wondering if you also have this, this impression that for a while it's necessary to be sort of hard edged about it. And make the point and then relent. Um, and also there was, for instance, for a long time, very interesting article in the New York Times about this, um, the, the screened audition, the auditions behind screen, because this allowed mm -hmm. to take more women into the orchestra. Okay, but now the movement is going the other way and saying, well, but now we have to be aware that we are actually still making choices that have to be somehow militant and therefore it's time to drop um, the and trust in a way that people are able to listen fairly, but that they take the diversity criterion into account when making decisions. So there are three, these three points that I would like loved you to pick up on before we, we have to close in about eight minutes. So we still want to leave some some room for questions. But if there is anything that you would like to observe about these, uh, this take on including into what and whether how, how hard is it necessary to be? I think boldness is absolutely necessary um, as a starting point. Uh, yesterday, um, the leaving um, uh, Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, um, had the last press conference and she was asked about feminism and and what she thought as 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 a chancellor of germany and she concluded the press conference um saying by um i thought things would change automatically and now after 16 years i can tell you you have to be very bold and i think i think that's absolutely true also uh, in this case and this clip that i um just showed you was from 2017 if you now would join a concert of the Chinica Orchestra, you would probably encounter a much more diverse orchestra, but it was necessary, I think, to make the point um, in, the first, um, uh, in the first few um, concerts that the orchestra gave to just shock and say, well, this mm -hmm. is totally different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I'm also very lucky uh, or happy that uh, also um, women and also black women conductors uh, um, uh, have led the ensemble in, in the meantime. Um, uh, and I think there will be more. Um, uh, and your third question was? 
Uh, no, the question was uh, actually was uh, it, it was um, not a question, but it was the point the about point. the uh, about the, the auditions behind the screen. Yes, and I think about the auditions. Well, I met people in the in um, of the Met Orchestra. They because they also performed uh, with Chinake, and um, they they did uh, almost hundred auditions, both of them, and didn't succeed with provincial orchestras in in the in the U.S. And the Met Orchestra uh, audition is completely uh, a blind audition, and that's the only orchestra they got in. So I think that's a very striking it's still, example. It's still, yeah. Um, it's uh, the solo trumpeter um, and and also one of the trombone uh, trombonists and and that's also a black clarinet uh, player who moved on to quite, the quite, New York yeah, Philharmonic. Quite, yes, but yes. Mm -hmm. um, they all had problems getting a job, and this was their only chance. So I think it's it's a it's not maybe a, it's not a scientific. It's not a not a not a. Yeah, uh, yeah. But it's a very striking example of of how that can work. Yeah, well, there was a, a, I mean, very quick remark because there is there is um, maybe a few questions. But um, one of the issues is how long the tenure of musicians is and how slow the change can be because the the it gets seems to get longer and longer, especially for men. To they have done a, 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 quite a few articles about how how the exchange rate. Of, of it happens in orchestras and it is so slow. And uh, especially for, for the males, they stay, statistics are very, very depressing in a way that the changes can only be brought drop by drop, you know? And so I, I think, I think um, it was a good point that you made, you know, it, it's still too early then to, to make this into, to, to, as we said, to trust the, the judgment um, and there, there are still people who have prejudice against women, for instance, and, and won't, in this competition, um, a, a, a woman conductor told me that she was judging a, a, a competition with women, uh, not, not just for women. She said, well, there, there were jurors two years ago who said, oh, well, yeah, women are not supposed to be on the podium. So why are they jurors of a competition, one asks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, are there- But I think we should be, yeah. be too depressed about it. And also institutions can change more quickly then. And then, mm -hmm. every orchestra needs management. And um, if, if uh, the rotation frequency is, is higher within management ranks, then let's start there and the mm -hmm. orchestra will follow, you know, um, I think you have to start somewhere and yep, absolutely. change will, will, abs will absolutely mm -hmm. happen. Yes, yes. Um, thank you so much. Um, well, we, we will hope to, to catch some of the, of the new, com can you tell us one or two of the of the composers that you will the names of a couple of composers that you will be including in the repertoire that we would not think of. Uh, well, the first one is, is Sami Musa, uh, a Franco-Canadian uh, composer I absolutely adore and had the great chance to meet uh, for the first time in person um, two days ago in Berlin, where he okay. where he lives. And uh, another one is uh, the uh, American composer Brian Raphael Nabors, who I think is very, very talented. Um, Can you put the names in the chat for us? Uh, I will, yeah, because if, I, we, if I technically manage, I will. Or, okay, otherwise we, and maybe in the meantime, if there is anyone from maybe from the pre, Verna who, who led the previous panel on Sami Musa, thank you very much, you are there. And, um, Vanna, maybe I don't know if you had, since you chaired the previous panel, do you see uh, joint issues that that could connect our work in bringing about change on, on how the environment is evolving, uh, where the education that we are trying to, to uh, make uh, more egalitarian and also more safe um, do you see that there, there is a different issue of safety when diversity is also concerned? I think the thing, was it, now I don't remember, was it Alice or Sasha who said that the main issue is to get together and start to discuss about the matter. And when we bring it to discussion, we will start to find the solutions. But if, if we don't raise it on the table, then yes. there it goes. Indeed. 
Um, but you know this this issue of of talent, and there there were still um, there is a, a book that was published um, twenty years ago, uh, asking the question why there have have there been no great women artists, and that was a a, a really a turning sorry forty years ago a, a really turning moment, and um, and there was a follow up why are there no great women composers, and and then in a way if you don't have the basic level. Uh, of support of, of a, a really equality. And Marion also also always makes this point. The point is not uh, the a, a point of Black Lives Matter only. It's that everything has to do with equality, and it's not women and men. It's it's not color. It is equality in general. And you you may not notice from the appearance that there is a problem of equality, but that's basically what we are driving at it. And that's why it's so important to connect the two and the three concepts also with inclusion. Because if we if we, we go back a little bit with with what we were discussing with Andreas Knapp um, at the beginning of, of this these three days, uh, if we don't remember that there are conditions that we are trying to improve uh, and you know, then, as Kevin suggested, um, almost quoting uh, Maestra Breu, you know, the, the planning is in the doing. Uh, that uh, Marshall Marcus several times reminded us of. Uh, then that we have what we have to do every time that we have the chance to take that handle, we should take it. Yes, and, and uh, sorry. No, 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 no. That yes. was my sort of my concluding remark. But I'm happy to. To, no. maybe, I'm very happy if Kevin would like to conclude, but but um, but Vanna, maybe you have one more observation. I just wanted to say that we are not there yet. Like we are thinking, we are living modern time, and but this is something that has been said 200 years ago. We think that we have solved all the problem and that we are uh, we have established a certain level of of what whatsoever, but we are far from it, and we have just grown into this model that that limits us from seeing what doesn't work. And it needs to be observed with a um, lot of criticism and hope. Yes. Yes. In the same time. Andreas, thank you for for appearing. I know you, we know you were there, but as you as you were evoked, um, you, you are in probably the most diverse and un underprivileged and uh, challenged environment that one can think of. Um, yes, um, but I think I always did, <clears throat> and I um, I work in this field since more than forty years. So having an audience in Siberia is the same than having children playing in the island of Kios. Um, excuse me, not a con con contemporary composer, but Mahler, which is very contemporary to them. Um, but I think I am. Um, there's one example which always goes to my mind. <clears throat> there is, in Europe, we are very much into football. There is not a single professional football club who doesn't run a youth section, but there is not a single professional orchestra in Europe who has a permanent playing children orchestra. So every chief conductor should bear in mind, why do I don't have this? And every manager uh, who doesn't um, has this should think about why do I don't have this and we um, what we do is just to uh, explain we founded string orchestras in the refugee camp in in Kios in Vial and in surroundings and we also asked some managers of high profiled professional orchestras if in this time of um, COVID when half of the orchestra is just walking around because they're not allowed to play and all these things, if they could just send us for four weeks a musician um, working with us, we didn't get, get a single reply. And this was proposed by musicians from the orchestra who would have come themselves, but they didn't get the permission and the managers did not even, even want to talk to us about it. And um, it's only a little, um, insight in that the and therefore I was very grateful for Jennifer this gives me a little bit of hope because I think the problems are never the children the, the problems are never 
on the side of the children. It's more that in the classical music I experienced, most of the people in the professional business, they don't think that's their business. That, that's a mm -hmm. change that Kevin can also take on board. Yes, so we to bridge the generations. And as Chineke is, is also very intergenerational, it seems, no? Absolutely. Um, there, and also, for, uh, thanks for, for that uh, comment, uh, Andreas. Um, that's also what I find is, is the strongest point about the Chineke Foundation, uh, that it has a, a youth orchestra attached. And what we see now that Chineke exists for more than five years is that mm -hmm. people who started at very young age and were really empowered um, uh, to see the opportunities that they that they could have that they are now starting to um to be accepted at the at the um at the universities and we see younger players uh, like shiku kane mason who was who started uh, also with the juniors um is now having an international career so yes uh Absolutely true. Absolutely mm -hmm. crucial um, to to uh, keep this in mind. Thank you. Thank you. So it really holds together with with what we are trying to to bring about with the, with these days of of reflection and sharing that we don't just look at the surface, but really try to see what we can do also at the deeper awareness level. That was our shared keyword. Thank you very much, Kevin, and uh, thanks everyone for being here and uh, definitely to be continued because I think everyone has has been thinking about this, has been doing their own bit. And um, if we put them all together, I think this critical mass being critical, <laughs> I think we, we have to be a bit more massive. Thank you so much.